Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you. Hoosiers around the heartland are gearing up for Valentine's Day. Discover romance with an Indiana twist. Listen to the soothing sounds of barbershop melodies in a new jazz crossroads. Explore Indiana film during an interview with famed director David Anspa. Meet artist Brian Getz as his latest balloon sculpture takes flight. And welcome Bloomington's dynamic duo Russ Baum and Huck Finn to the studio. Curl up as we venture from music halls to movie theaters. It's all coming up on the weekly special. Welcome to the weekly special. I'm Erica Sagone. For generations, Hoosiers have been inspired by love. A love for music, a love for movies, and often a love of their Indiana communities. And to begin tonight, we'll learn about a group inspired by all three. Emerging from the underground parties of the 1920s, jazz continued to crisscross college campuses. Over the next decades, jazz artists discovered a new venue for their performances that took them far away from the smoky nightclubs and into the halls of the academy, making collegiate America fertile ground for new sounds. In the Hoosier heartland, one such sound proved so innovative it would become one of the most imitated jazz quartets to hit the musical scene. The singing group The Four Freshmen really were freshmen when they all met at Butler University's Arthur Jordan Conservatory of Music in Indianapolis in 1947. They were all homegrown Hoosiers, too. Brothers Ross and Don Barber came from Columbus. Bob Flanagan hailed from Greencastle. And Hal Cratch was from Warsaw. It was one day after a shared music theory class that Hal approached Ross with a proposition. Let's start a quartet and Hal's harmonizers began entertaining the Butler campus with melodies inspired by Johnny Mercer and the Pied Pipers. By the end of their freshman year, reveling in their newfound popularity, the boys left the Butler halls for the Midwest clubs, recruiting friend Bob Flanagan as their new lead voice and renaming themselves the Four Freshmen. It was a chance meeting with popular big band leader Stan Kenton in 1950 that would shape their sound and their career. Kenton's progressive arrangements inspired the four freshmen to shift from basic barbershop vocals to bold, complex harmonies. Flanagan recalled, I knew we had to develop something more than what we were doing. So, probably because I played trombone myself, I started paying careful attention to the trombone section. We tried to imitate their sound, their phrasing. After being told about a quartet in town that sounded like his 43-piece ensemble, Kenton attended the four freshmen's performance at the Esquire Lounge in Dayton, Ohio. The concert did not disappoint. Kenton immediately arranged an audition with his label. Within months, the four freshmen signed to Capitol Records, but their first releases failed to sell well, and the label dropped them. It was Stan Kenton, their biggest advocate, who persuaded Capitol to go ahead and give the freshmen copies of their recording It's a Blue World to distribute to radio DJs. The song took off, becoming the group's first charted single, and by July of 1952, Capitol Records re-signed the group. It's a Blue World was the start of a series of freshman recordings that stamped themselves on the collective consciousness of a 1950s undergraduate following, including The Day Isn't Long Enough, How Can I Tell Her, Please Remember, and Angel Eyes. With you away, how empty they have grown. If you think you've heard the four freshmen sound before, you probably have, in the form of a group that came after them, 
and whose primary creative personality counted himself as a fan, Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. Wilson later reminisced about the countless hours he spent as a young boy deconstructing each melody. The four freshmen, their hearts were full of spring, so enchanted Wilson that he lifted the vocal arrangement note by note as A Young Man Is Gone, and then under the original title for the live Beach Boys 69 LP. It wasn't just their singing that kept the four freshmen's sound compelling, however. Over the years, the group strove to reimagine their iconic sound, introducing new instrumentation such as trumpets, guitars, and violins. In addition to recording numerous concept albums, the freshmen kept up a prolific touring schedule across America, focusing especially on college campuses. Through the years, members of the four freshmen would come and go, with the last original member, Bob Flanagan, retiring in 1993, over 50 years after the four freshmen first hit the jazz scene. Rarely has any musical group endured the longevity that the four freshmen accomplished. New incarnations of their sound continue to resonate throughout modern music. And to think it all began on that one afternoon as four young freshmen walked the halls of Butler University. To learn more about the four freshmen or other fantastic Hoosier Jazz connections, visit indianapublicmedia.org. Well, we are honored to welcome famed Indiana film and TV director David Anspa. He directed such films as Rudy and Hoosiers, and he's now the executive producer of a new film, The Good Catholic, right here in Bloomington. David, thanks so much for being in the studio today. My pleasure. Now, you are a Hoosier. You graduated from IU in 1970. You left and you made films and you made TV and now you're back in Bloomington full time yeah. and uh, you're making The Good Catholic. Tell us about this movie. Well, I was lucky to be asked to be part of this group, wonderful group of guys that uh, are doing this movie that uh, Paul Schulberg, who lives out in Brown County and an IU graduate, uh, and Zach Spicer, who is a theater graduate, um, decided to do this film based on Paul's mother and father. Father was a priest, mother was a nun, and their love story about how they met and both left their orders and lived happily ever after. Uh, why, was this, why was this movie filmed in Bloomington? I think probably because Paul lives nearby and, <laughs> and, and also, no, I mean that, you know, he, he wanted to keep it in Indiana and if he kept it in Bloomington, he wouldn't have to travel because he has a family and all. And between the connections that Paul had and Zach and Graham Shelton and uh, John Armstrong and myself, um, I, mean, I wasn't asked to come on until just a couple months ago, but between all of us, we had enough connections that it sort of offset the cost of what it would, you know, with, we're, we're working in a state without tax incentives. Yeah, I want to talk about that a little bit because Indiana was obviously really crucial in your film career. You made Hoosiers here, you made Rudy here, but we don't often think of Indiana as a big state for movies. Fill us in on the sort of what the challenges are for filmmakers in Indiana. Well, the challenges are getting legislation passed to offer those financial incentives to anyone that one is looking for film location. And we have such beautiful locations, you know, from like the, the kind of terrain in southern Indiana and our beautiful state parks up to like the white sands of, uh, you know, dunes at, on Lake Michigan. Um, you could shoot a scene, you could shoot a scene and say you were in the Hamptons and you could pull it off right here in Indiana. Um, but we just have to, uh, we have to get the lawmakers on board, you know, otherwise Paul's end up or anybody else ends up in Atlanta where they're shooting 32 movies and TV shows right now. So tell me, tell me a little bit more about what Indiana needs to offer. Well, yeah. basically a tax incentive so that it will make it attractive for filmmakers to come here. When, I mean, there sh when we did Hoosiers and Rudy, uh, again, we took advantage of the fact that we were from Indiana and we did have connections and that sort of offset things. Um, the fact that we didn't have, they didn't have a tax advantage then. Uh, 
it wasn't offered. So great that you had connections, well, but you don't want everyone to have to feel that way. No, and, and also, it also helps um, students that are coming out of Indiana schools, IU, Purdue, Notre Dame, whatever, who are looking to find work in the film industry, how great would it be to not have to go to California or New York or, or Georgia um, and, and be able to come right out of school and walk into a job right here in Indiana. Well, but that ain't gonna happen until they change the laws. Sure, well I think we're all hoping that there's a future for you know film in Indiana. And David, thank you very much for shedding a little bit of light on what's going on and for talking to us about The Good Catholic. Good luck with that. Thank you so much. <laughs> To get the latest information about the upcoming film, visit thegoodcatholicmovie.com. You can also visit WFIU's art page to listen to Yael Cassander's extended interview with the Good Catholic producers. Well, our next subject has found a unique way to celebrate film. It's an art installation you have to see to believe. Most don't remember their first balloon. Most don't remember their last. But what if your first or last balloon was a 25-foot TIE fighter from Star Wars? Could you possibly forget it? Who is the man behind this artistic feat? And how did he create something so astounding? I'm Brian Getz, and I'm a professional balloon artist. I actually started making balloons back when I was a college student. Got a kit for Christmas, thought it'd be a fun hobby. It very quickly turned into a fun job as I worked my way through college. And then after I uh, worked on a master's degree, I said, you know, I'm going to make this my career. I do balloon decor. I do balloon entertainment. I'm now making balloons, dogs, and swords, and hats, and stuff for folks. But I also do huge balloon installations, uh, some of the biggest balloon sculptures in the world. Not just the biggest, but the biggest balloon sculptures in the world. Brian's 2008 Dragonfly installation at the Indiana State Museum holds a Guinness World Record. So it's no wonder that the biggest balloon artist in the U.S. is honoring the biggest movie in the U.S. Today we're making a TIE Fighter from Star Wars. It's a 25 foot tall spaceship and it has two huge panels on the side of it. And we're going to be flying it from a hot air balloon. Using 3,500 balloons and over 18 hours of work, the TIE Fighter began taking shape. It really makes you wonder though, how did such an interesting idea come about? So it's actually kind of a cool story for why we're doing this project. I got engaged about a month ago and I took my fiance up in a hot air balloon and I ended up uh, meeting the owner of the company and I said, you know, I could fly any one of these big huge sculptures from a hot air balloon. And about half an hour later, we had plans, rigging diagrams, crew, dates, everything was entirely set up to do this TIE Fighter build. Over two dozen volunteers, both professional and amateur balloonists alike, helped construct the final masterpiece. Such an awesome feat would not have been accomplished without a little teamwork. I wanted to thank my awesome crew for being a part of this. I really can't do it without their help, and it's just amazing to have such awesome balloon artists and such an awesome community in the uh, balloon arena here that people are willing to come out for free and uh, work for two days straight to make something awesome come together. After the long and hard-working journey, the massive TIE Fighter finally took flight. From balloon hats to breaking world records, one thing's for sure, Brian's balloon feats will only get bigger and better. To see more of Brian's creations or to learn about how you can participate, visit his website, briansballoons.com. For over 150 years, Heinel's Flower Shop in Terre Haute brought smiles to loved ones across the state. Henry Ward Beecher once said that flowers are the loveliest things God ever made without a soul. It was that same creed that inspired John Heinel to create his flower shop in 1863. As a man, he was very generous, very kind, very compassionate, very giving man. He just loved people and he loved helping people. When you see something growing outside that's blooming, when spring hits, it just makes people happy. I mean, it brings a smile to their face. So he loved that about them and the beauty of the flowers and what they would do to people. And I think you have to know your past 
before you can know your present and future. And I had people say, well, are you going to change the name of Heinel's? And I said, no, I don't want to change the name. He's the one that started the business, and I want to help keep his legacy going. It's been that kind of dedication that has allowed Heinel's Flower Shop to continue to thrive. Now, 150 years later, Heinels is considered one of the oldest running florists in the Midwest. Vonda purchased Heinels Flower Shop after a tragic turn of events led her back to a childhood love. My husband and I started a construction business and um, we had just had gotten it going really well and then he was diagnosed with leukemia. I kept the construction business going after he died but it wasn't my passion. I grew up gardening and flowers with my dad. It's just been a natural avenue and something that I've loved to do. So that's how I ended up buying the flower shop 11 years ago. While a few changes have been made to the shop, the mission of Pinel's remains the same, even with the onslaught of big box distributors and online competition. One of my favorite sayings is, the earth laughs in flowers. I want people to know the value of nature. We take care of our flowers. We process our buckets twice a week. We process the flowers twice a week. The big box stores don't do that. And uh, they don't do as much education as what we try to do as florists with our customers because people work hard for their money and I want them to have a long shelf life. I don't want them to think, oh, your flowers are really expensive. Well, they are compared to some of the grocery stores, but there's a lot more involved than what we're doing, and we are in the business. They aren't. But it's not just the quality of the flowers and education that set local florists apart. It is also the level of customer interaction. Well, we're here to help them out. I mean, we let them come in, smell the flowers, and check them out. Uh, sort of give them an idea. Everybody says, draw me a picture. So we start gathering flowers up and sort of give them that concept. And then a lot of times when you walk into department stores and things like that, they just sort of see what's on the floor and they got to take what's there. Here, we can take and sort out just, just about anything and everything that you want. We're in the emotion business. We deal with emotions every day. You know, people always say, why get flowers are just going to die? Well, my comment to that is, Life's about moments. That's all we have are moments. So in that moment, if you get a beautiful flower arrangement, that's what you're going to remember. That's where then we try to come in to keep that moment going and take care of the flowers. But life is about moments and moments that takes your breath away. So that's what we hope that we can do. Unfortunately, we're sad to report that Heinel's has since closed, but the good news is that the property has been bought by a local family with plans to open a restaurant in May of this year, so it will continue to be part of the Terre Haute community. Certainly, community has been an important part of what brought our next musicians together. Let's learn more about Russ Baum and Huck Finn. We met 15 years ago on that open mic night. Got up and played a few songs. Thought it'd be pretty cool to do this for a living one day and asked him how I could get there. I go, play for 10 years, get some experience, and if I'm alive and you're alive, you're playing, give me a call. He did. It's a faded night above God's port, and there's a star in the sky. We practice five to seven days a week. Live practices in front of our audience, new songs. We bring them together without, usually without discussion, usually without warning. <laughs> our bond is very special. It's almost hard to describe. It's more than a marriage. We have to trust each other. Some of the rewards out of playing with this young man is watching him grow and develop. From where he was when I first saw him, 15 years later where he became, and seeing him develop, it's been an honor. The most important things I believe I've learned has been don't give up, don't be afraid to make the phone calls, don't be afraid to just continue to bother people that tell you no because you're in the business of rejection. Nine out of 10 or more, maybe the answer is no, but there's always gonna be the one yes. We have this drive inside of us that says we will and we believe. The drive to know that this is what I was born to do 
to prove that, you know, just because people say it can't be done doesn't mean it can't be. You gotta believe in yourself before anyone else will. It's like gardening. You plant a seed and watch it grow. As you grow up, you see people actually like what you're doing and they come back to hear you again. There's a lot of priceless joy you get out of when you, you sign up for this kind of life and, and give yourself up for music. To make yourself a successful artist would be to lift someone up. It is about your heart and your feelings and your feelings towards people and everyone around you. You meet so many people when you're playing, they're really sad and something's not right. So you have to give them something to have hope for and a feeling and we try to present a feeling there's hope. You need hope, everybody needs hope. We have hope. And now, Russ Baum and Huck Finn. Well, I've seen the end of the line too many times. Then I just turned around, walked away from the light. Then I pushed the limits on this life of mine. And I'm so lucky, yes, so lucky to be alive. From fast cars to fast bikes. Bad drugs and wild nights To rough bars and bar fights I ain't proud, but it's my life And I sit around and watch the time go And I float around like a white ghost Now am I alive? Just singing from my soul Here's to getting drunk with your buddies To their friendship and family love Now without you I would be nothing Now how would I rise above And to the friends I have lost Oh that someday I will find Now you may have left this world No but you didn't leave me behind And I sit around and watch the time go and I float around like a white ghost Now am I alive to sing it from my soul da 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 For a list of their upcoming performances, visit their website, russbaumandhuckfinn.com. Well, that's all for this episode of the Weekly Special. However you choose to celebrate what you love, have a wonderful weekend. Once again, Russ Baum and Huck Finn, good night. Well, tomorrow will you remember me? It's a song I play and the words you sing. It's another empty bottle of whiskey. Side. You might not think I'm thinking much of you, but it's getting kind of late and I don't want to argue. I promise in the morning everything will be alright. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Drink to the good times of today. Oh, 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 oh. Now will you remember me tomorrow? You were both so sick of this stupid game. Let's stop. Just work out things, don't you know, little girl? Come and
into my arms. Yeah, I know it's pretty shady, all the things I said, but when I'm out of my mind, you know I don't use my head. Come on, little girl, you know I didn't mean no harm. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Drink to the good times of today. Oh, 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 oh. Now will you remember me tomorrow? Production support for the weekly special is provided by IU School of Public Health Bloomington, addressing public health needs by preventing disease, promoting health, and improving quality of life across the state and around the world through research, teaching, and community engagement. The Alcobine Recognition Endowment Fund, established by friends and family of Alcobine to support jazz initiatives on WTIU and WFIU. And WTIU members, thank you 